Dogs, Dalamud has returned. The fury of Bahama has raised so much ether into the world. Its fury cannot be stopped. We've tried everything. It's over for us. Twelve be praised. Full sure was I that I had come too late. But what, what are you doing here? I wished to share some words of seeming import. I would fashion a device with the capacity to generate a massive disruption in the surrounding ether. My humble scheme asked far more in the execution than it required in the conception. I can assure me, the shock of exposure to a more amplitudinous etheric waveform would be akin to a debilitating bout of ether sickness. The available anecdotal evidence suggested only that uncommonly sensitive to etheric fluctuations uh, thanks. was this which led me to develop my strategy. Though undeniably powerful, huh. taxeth you greatly in the fielding, which shall serve you just as well against all but the most formidable. You can show up now, man. Hope that this ancient wisdom may serve to guide Good you job. on your journey. For what dangers lie in wait for you are yet. When last we left off, it had been the tumultuous moment of the fall of Kosetsu and Yatsuyu. They are down. They are down and gone. Apparently. But there's a few things I want to talk about first. So many of you have been really interested in what I thought about the raiding and stuff like that. I still have not found the raid in Stormblood. And it's kind of bothering me a little bit uh i haven't seen what has exposed it or seen it anywhere not like with heaven's ward where there was obviously something ominous about the giant time bubble that sits in the middle of the zone i haven't seen anything like that so far so i can't comment on that not only that i've only fought three primals and i've now finished the msq now those primals were good but i can only assume that they decided to either stray back from the primals a little bit or the individual extremes or they're back loaded into being released over the course of the expansion which is what i suspect is happening here now the primals i did do were fantastic they were really really extraordinarily good i haven't been lakshmi in particular was a really fun uh experience not just because of the booba but in fact because it was a super super cool and interesting thing to see and that's been fine. They're just not that kind of variety. I can't really compare them apples to oranges. They've been fine so far, and I still don't know where the raid is. What I can say is the dungeons in Stormblood, uh, throughout the, in the launch version of, Star of Stormblood, have been great. All of them. That's been the most impressive thing I've seen so far in Stormblood has been these dungeons. Uh, the big thing that is actually the biggest topic of conversation around Stormblood is, of course, the story. Now, before I get too into that, I do want to talk about the actual job system and the story that goes along with that so in starblood they decided to change things up and i didn't know this in that they decided to give you your spells via leveling for the most part and then the story is just a story up until the very end where previously in order to get your new spells and abilities you would level usually every two levels or something then you would get a story quest and that would result in you gaining your new spells. So why did they move away from that? Well, after thinking about it, at first I was a little disappointed because I did my story thing and I didn't get my spells. As it turned out, I already had them. I had got them while leveling up. Now, previously I had got some things while leveling up and some things through the story quest. But this was fine, actually, because I then thought about, oh, the reason they're doing this is they want people to be able to play through the whole story in one go if they want to do that. They want to enjoy it as a singular story quest. It'll still give you something at the very end once you get your level 70 quest, but they don't, some people aren't happy with doing it piecemeal by doing like one story quest, getting kind of into it, and then going back to doing the ordinary stuff, then coming back later. I personally didn't mind that, but I can definitely see people who'd be like, right, today I want to sit down and I want to do my job quest. I want to go through that in a nice, smooth way, back to back while I'm fully immersed in the story and enjoy that. That was cool. I had this story, obviously I'm doing Black Mage, and uh, a lot of people ask me this question. I'm not looking at doing alternative jobs until either I get bored of the Black Mage or until Endgame. Uh, like Endwalker stuff. That's because I'm happy with what I'm playing right now. If I wasn't happy, I would gladly re-roll. I'm very happy with what I'm doing right now. Uh, so that's, that's the reason. I am going to look at them. That is going to happen. But it will be when I at later. I'm not. Some, I'm not planning to do like class guides or anything in the next 20 minutes. That's not going to happen. Uh, that's absolutely nothing that's on the cards. That's not going to go that way. But if you have another Black Mage quest, it involves Shitoto and an impending disaster. A meteor about to crash into the planet, uh, and uh, you need to stop it with the ultimate power of Shitoto, who has risen from the grave and all this kind of stuff. So I won't spoil the job quest too much because I imagine compared to the MSQ, far few people have done those things. But the premise was great. The payoff was really 
really cool. I was definitely... Uh, I'm always looking, and I think I've been trained, certainly by MMO stories, that there's always some ridiculous twist. Uh, and I hunt for it, like an M. Night Shyamalan movie, and I, it's something I'm trying to pull myself out of. Uh, but I was definitely expecting some something ridiculous to happen, something silly. Perhaps Hildebrand's storylines have kind of influenced me this way, because FF can go in that direction where it's really silly. Uh, but that's not the way this went it actually was like pretty straight up in terms of how how much how dangerous the situation was how big the stakes were and having a decent enough payoff at the end uh it certainly wasn't as good as a realm reborn's black mage storyline um it was okay it was kind of on par with heaven's wards uh it was it was fine it was fine i don't think she's so so that interesting a character kind of funny but certainly compared to Coco Busi, who I'm glad to say does show up, which blew my mind, shows up in Stormblood. That was great. To see the return of the Thaumaturges at the end, I was like, oh my god. And I was definitely of the opinion that maybe, depending on your job or what job quests you've done, different characters would have shown up and made their presence felt in the battle for Alamigo. Uh, and that's not the case. <laughs> that's not the case at all. It was just literally like, no, these are part of the game. Uh, Black Mages will be very familiar with who these characters are. But not everybody will be, and that's okay. And my god, did my heart melt at that idea. It's like, yeah, not everybody's going to get this. It's fine. For everybody else, these will just be a bunch of Black Mages. Uh, for the Black Mages, though, there's a lot of history and a lot of story there. And it's one of those things that made me go, I think I got lucky here. I think I got very lucky. But I now do want to do a lot of the other job stories because no doubt stuff like that is going to happen in the future. And what the worst thing is, is like, oh, yeah, did you not know that X and Y is blah, blah, blah? I'm like, no, I didn't know that. And it's like, oh, he loses that impact. And having that feeling of looking at Kokobusi show up and be like, oh, it's Kokobusi. Sick. Uh, and it's the boys, and they're kicking ass. This is awesome. This is so cool. So that much, I very much enjoyed. Uh, okay, uh, so Stormblood's main story. I'm going to kind of give my conclusion to the main MSQ today. Uh, it's a mixed bag. I don't think there's any surprises there. I really enjoy that you guys recognize that I'm just being, like, as genuine as I can. I'm not fanboying or anything. There are things I liked, and there are things I didn't like. Uh, I certainly, overall, rate the Stormblood main MSQ way lower than Heaven's Ward. Heaven's Ward was fantastic. It got even better with the post-MSQ stuff. But the main bulk of, ish of, uh, of Heaven's Ward was so good. Uh, Stormblood is not that. It's okay. Uh, it's passable. It's kind of... I would... My worst criticism I can give it, or the most scathing criticism I can give it, is it... It's on par for what I would expect for some MMO stories. And that's really disappointing. I am I am disappointed. Uh, but let's get into a little bit of detail about why I'm disappointed. So at the intro, we did a little thing there because, yeah, the use of MacGuffins. I, I talked about this in the last video. Is like, I really hope they don't go down this road of having build up to something and then just have a ridiculous payoff that just nullifies everything that you're doing. So last time it was the Kojin relic that was so easy to find and every, if the Kojin wanted to find this thing they should have been able to find it in five minutes. Instead they've been scouring the ocean forever looking for it. Um, they even have like torches that make it glow in the dark. Right? It was just so dumb. Uh, but they did it twice more after that in a really egregious way. Um, like I said, I don't, I, I brought a Moon Breeder in the intro because I don't mind the idea of a MacGuffin if there's a little bit of setup to it, a little bit of, like, let's make this work. So we had the problem with the Asians, and so Moon Breeder's like, hey, I, there's a thing we can do with the, the, the white ether, we can kind of make this work. And you're like, okay, where did this come from? But then you spend some time, you're like, okay, let's figure this stuff out. And then it writes itself into the canon of a way of dealing with the Asians, and it's like, okay, that's fine. Um... Let's talk about Fordola a little bit then. Uh, great character. Loved Fordola and still love Fordola. I'm really interested to see what they do with her character. This um, A couple of things they've done with a couple of characters, including Yotsuyu, um, is that they've made it very clear that this sort of holier-than-now white knight attitude towards Doma and Alamigo, which is that you were born there, ergo you should feel something for this place, uh, is bullshit. And I love this. I absolutely love this because they've made it very apparent is no some people didn't have a good time there some people were actually treated miserably and horribly there some people had no reason to support alamigo or doma at all they may have been born there but the place was horrible to them from the day one and the fact that this uh projected force of you owe it to alamigo you owe it to doma to look after your people is a complete fabrication because why 
Why would I ever owe you anything? And it's not a justification. And this was a big debate that happened with the people who were watching it live when we were discussing this. It's like, oh, they're just trying to justify her being evil. It's like, no, they're not justifying her being evil. They're pointing out that she doesn't owe them a goddamn thing. And these people are always like, you owe it to the people. You're a traitor. You're scum. It's like, I don't owe you a fucking thing. I don't owe you a goddamn thing. Uh, and that was very part of the... It's certainly more prevalent with Yotsu, but the, it was very prevalent with Fodola as well. She has her absolute reasons for the way she's behaving. She completely has a, has a motive and a reason to be the way she is. And she's evil. She really wants to rise up in the Empire, to prove to the Empire that she's strong and she's she's worthy of power. Um, and th th her relationship with Xenos was really interesting. It was really interesting. I like what they did with her. What I did not like, of course, is that they made her very powerful. That was great. I like that they made her very powerful. She was rising through the ranks. She was getting what she wanted. Uh, she was moving up in the world. He saw, very similar to the Incredible Hulk movie with the Abomination, uh, is that they, they, you know, the potential was there. Let's enhance her. Let's. She's got this fire. Certainly Xenos loves that. She's got spirit. She's a great fighter. Let's boost her up. And then we get the reveal that the uh, of the Magitech that is able to infuse the ether into people uh, and give them the echo, uh, which is really kind of curious as to where they're going with that. So... That was great. The payoff in order to fight her, though, was incredibly disappointing, is you literally have Arianje walk into the middle of the desert after not hearing from him, no Link Pearl, nothing. Oh, yeah, Alice told me about the thing, so I made this for you, and this will defeat Fordola for you. Bye! <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. And uh, it was... <laughs> it just was like, all right. <laughs> again, they did it again. Ugh. Uh, it was it was a grumble grumble moment, but whatever. We got on with it. We moved past it, and we did have a really great fight. They had turned her into Albert Wesker. That is literally what they did with Four Dollars. They made her into Albert Wesker, which was great. I was kind of curious as to what we were going to do about it. I just suspected we were some way of draining her power or stunning her or something. Just turn up in the middle of the desert though, with like and voila, and there you go. You, you're going to need this, and I've made it in my basement based on what Alice told me. It's all good. Well, yeah, 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 we've had something similar in the past, it's fine, go, just go ahead, uh, bye now, and go and wander on his way, uh, which, it's fine enough, sure, <laughs> let's go with that, uh, which, we, we end up dealing with the $4 character, um, we should talk a little bit about Xenos, which is possibly the most disappointing part of Stormblood for me, because, as I said in the last video, I really liked Xenos, he wasn't just a one-dimensional, I crave power, uh, big bad dude, uh, he wasn't that, he had power and every, everything he had was just a resource to do what he enjoyed he could it was too easy for him uh to to win and to conquer it was he was just looking for some good fights to have um and doing and then manipulating the people and the the surrounding areas and with cruelty and punishment in order to try and generate that eventually of course the warrior of light but generate that competition that sports he so longed for and everything else he did was purely in the service of that one goal uh and i like that because it, it gave him all these alternative motives he was fine to let us win he was fine to let us do something uh ultimately though uh the final confrontation with him he immediately gains more power which was like, it turns into a, spectacularly, a spectacularly good boss fight. It does. There's no getting away from that. But, but, we do have the uh, awkwardness that this guy who's been lusting for all his power because he's reached this pinnacle, he's reached this apex, and he's looking for a challenging fight, immediately, like, runs to gain more power as soon as that doesn't pay off. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I can't avoid him to stand up and uh, fight for every last breath. Like, I was expecting some real... Real fire there. Something's very epic. I would have been uh, fine with him being forced to become a primal. That would have been interesting. But, uh, yeah, you, you fight him in a dungeon. So it's not overly difficult. Uh, and then he immediately runs against more power. So, eh, a little bit of a weak payoff for that. And then he does kill himself at the end. Which I did expect, similar to what we talked about in the last video, actually. Uh, is what happens in Itchy the Killer with the Kakahari character. Once that challenge cannot be met it was a different twist which i think is where they went off the rails or perhaps i was projecting that storyline onto xenos uh entirely possible uh but also takes his own life um so that was fine uh it was it was okay it was just a bit and then they broke into song 
which was so inappropriate. Like, the song itself was fine. It was a good matching song. It's just they immediately broke into the song. Um, and again, they did the, the kind of two other Deus Ex Machina things that really bothered me. One was that Shinryu is at the back of the castle that Thancred has been scoping out for quite some time now. As well as an army sort of trying to gain access and look for it, ways in and do all those kind of things. And they didn't notice that Shinryu was just up on the balcony. That thing is huge. <laughs> I think it's absolutely enormous, and they just didn't notice. So, Pankred, you need to step up your game, son, as a as a sleuth, as a stealth master, as somebody who was. I know you're looking for Kryle, and Kryle is very small, but I mean, <laughs> should be is really, really noticeable, uh, especially when you go up on that balcony. Uh, the other one that would like, again bothered me a little bit. I'm gonna get to the positives of there, like the four dollar story, I and mean, everything leading up to the Xenos ultimate confrontation was fine. It was really good. Uh, it was the Astinian Batman scenario. Uh, the, 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 it was just, it was an awkward scene where they have the giant cannon that they rain fire on their own troops. This was a very, or should have been an even better moment for me because you had the moment where Fordola forces, um, the troops to fire on their own men and her own men, the men she started this journey with, uh, the troops that she's come to rely and trust on and they rely on her and trust her and she murders them. Um, under orders of the Empire in order to prove her worth. And I think she's going to flip. I think she is going to defect uh, based on this moment. And it was a very impactful moment because clearly this is not something she wants to do, but she feels she needs to do uh, in order to curry the favor that she wants. But I, it was definitely a moment of... She, this is where her mind might be changing about exactly how she's pursuing her goals. She still wants the goal, but how it's, how it's unfolding is probably not quite what she wants. And now she's very powerful. She might be able to turn her attention in a different way. I would not be surprised to see her defect after that moment. So it had a lot of impact because there's a lot of injury. There's a lot of death to our, our own troops, uh, as well as now the Empire is starting to see that, oh, wait a minute, you guys are killing us as well. Uh, but then they were instantly presented with the problem after, and this is kind of like Stormblood in a nutshell, is they wrote this really epic moment, uh, or this really cool thing, like make, making Fordola into Albert Wesker, because that's going to be cool, or having the giant cannon that'll rain down fire on their own troops will be really cool, but they wrote themselves into a little bit of a hole as to how to deal with that later on, and all they could come up with was that Estinian on his one-man journey for Dragon's Eyes, uh, leaps out of nowhere, destroys the cannon, and then vanishes into the ether. The Stinian's a close friend. We, we're like, <laughs> we're really, really close. There's no reason for this kind of thing to happen. It was just, um, Estinian out of nowhere. Um, which, <sighs> again, it just took, it took a, it was just like, okay, uh, and nobody knows anything. They're like, what happened? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, mm. Yeah, uh, it was. It was again. It was a series. I think Stormblood in a nutshell for me in terms of the main MSQ has been a series of. Oh, this is really good. And then after Heaven's Ward, you're very much under Realm Reborn. You're very much expecting this really good payoff, and it just misses the mark every time. Not by much. It's not like oh, this is awful. Like I roll awful. It's more like oh, okay. Like that's kind of something I would expect from other games, but I don't expect it here. I don't expect it here. So there is that moment. Uh, ultimately, though, one thing that's really got me boggled is one, Lisa's redemption arc. Lisa's actually a fine character now. Uh, Lisa's much, much better. The, the maturity arc was hit or miss, again, Stormblood style. Uh, but it's gotten to where it needs to be now, where Lisa is still making mistakes, but learning. Uh, and actually coming as a better character. And I still don't know where his taller is. No idea what's going on there. But the teasers for the post-MSQ look amazing. They look amazing. So we've... I called that Yotsu and Gosetsu were still alive. And I even called that they washed up on a tropical island. Because it is mentioned that they went down river. And I joked that I think... What if they... I said, what if they wash up on an island and now they've lost their memories and they're living as like a happy couple? Not far off <laughs> from what I can tell. Not far off at all for that situation. Uh, but now with Xenos gone, which I'm really surprised by, we have this, um, the Emperor's coming in. And I'm really curious to see now with Yasu gone and Xenos gone, Fordola seemingly out of action, what is the Empire's game plan going to be? Now, we know the Asians are involved now because of the post credit cutscene. As to what is happening with the Empire as a whole. And 
seemingly every story thread they've teased for what is coming looks much better than the main MSQ. So that is going to be my next drive. And also finding the raid. That is definitely going to be the next point. So I'm really excited to see what happens with this storyline. And I'm definitely curious what they're doing with Yotsuyu. I'm not surprised they're still alive because their characters weren't done. Uh, and you can kind of tell when a character is done. You can always write more, but there's a point where you feel that character is done. That hadn't happened for Gosetsu, and it had not happened for Yotsuyu yet. Um, so, fingers crossed on this one. I have more than words for you, my lady. Thank you all so much for watching. Happy New Year. I hope 2022 is going to be amazing. We held the biggest... New Year's Eve party in Final Fantasy XIV history. I'm going to show you that in the next couple of days, as well as finally, now that I am free of illness, be able to go to our new office and show that off for you as well. So stay tuned, make sure you're subbed for the next few days. And as always, check out our website for any more details and things that are upcoming that you might want to get involved in. Thank you so much, guys, and I'll see you again. Bye-bye.